Hi, my name is Scott Page. I'm a professor at the Stephen Ross School of Business at the University of Michigan. Welcome to Understanding Epidemics, a many model approach. In this video, I'm going to cover the SIR model, which is the fundamental model of epidemics. SIR stands for Susceptible, Infected, and Recovered. What it's going to do is going to provide micro foundations. In other words, it's going to give us a model that helps us understand the patterns that we see in the data based on fundamental assumptions about how people interact and how diseases spread from people to people. To explain why the SIR model is so important, I want to first describe something called the wisdom hierarchy. So we have lots of data, particularly for something like COVID-19, there's more and more data pouring in every day. That data is only useful if we transform it into information, if we put it into categories so we can read it in charts and draw inferences. So we can look at data on COVID based on region, and we can chart that, and we can see these patterns in the data. And we can also look over time in many countries, and we see these sort of familiar patterns where the curve kind of goes up, and then hopefully eventually sort of tops off. The information is just a pattern. What we'd like to have is knowledge. We'd like to have detailed understanding of why do we get those patterns. That's where models come in. Models help us understand why we see the patterns we do. So the SIR model is going to explain to us why we see that sharp upturn and then a flattening in the number of cases. So here's how the model works. We assume there's some population of people and we divide that population into three categories. The first category is those people that are susceptible to get the disease. The second is those that are infected, those that have the disease. And the third group is those that are recovered. Among those that we categorize as recovered, we will include the fatalities. We're going to use those categories to come up with a formula for the number of newly infected people. Well, the number of newly infected people are going to depend on the number of infected people. And it's going to depend on how many contacts each of those infected persons has. So how many people does someone who's infected bump into in a given day? In order for the disease to spread, though, it has to spread to someone who doesn't have the disease. So for each of those contacts, we need to figure out the probability that they're someone who doesn't have it. So that's going to be the susceptible people divided by the whole population. But even when two people meet, it doesn't necessarily mean that the disease is going to spread. So we've got to multiply this by the transmission probability, or, what's, or we can just call this the spread, the likelihood if two people are in contact, one who has the disease and one who doesn't have the disease, that the disease spreads. To create the full SIR model, we also have to take into account the probability that somebody recovers. So for all those infected people, in addition to spreading the disease, they might also recover. And this is going to be the key inequality in the, the SIR model. Is it the case that the number of newly infected people, that's the term on the left, is bigger than the number of people who recover? If so, the disease will spread. If it's smaller, then the disease will go away. Here's where this model becomes so useful. We can use it to explain why we see the patterns that we see. If we look, for example, at flu or any other disease, we see this familiar pattern where it starts out slow, gets really fast, and then tapers off. So here's what the SIR model produces. It produces this curve, this red curve that we're infected, that starts out slow, goes up, and then goes down. What's important about this is early on in this process, you're only going to see a very small slope. You're going to see just a few cases. And if you ran a linear model of that, you would have no reason to worry. You would just say, look, there's very few people, it's increasing very slowly, nothing to worry about. But if you're on the SIR model, you see this massive increase. From an epidemiological standpoint, those increases, that increase in the red line, the increase in the number of infected, is like the small lump you might see in a CAT scan. It's the hint that something's happening that could grow really, really fast. How do we know that? Well, let's look at our model. Early in the epidemic, there's very few infected people. So if we look at the number of newly infected, that can't be very large because the number of infected people is so small. So there's gonna be a very small slope. As the number of infected people increases, each of them can spread that disease. You get more people spreading the disease, so the curve slopes up. Now, when you get to the peak, you might think everything's fine, but actually it's not, because at the peak, you've got a whole bunch of infected people. The only reason the number of total number of infected people starts to go down 
is because now you're getting more and more people who are recovered. So what the model shows us is that because the number of infected starts out small and gets, then gets bigger, but then at the end, the number of susceptible becomes small, you're gonna get this sort of S-shaped curve in the number of cases that reaches a peak and then falls off. How then do we use this model to act? We've used it to explain the pattern. How can we use it to act? In particular, people talk about flattening the curve. How do we flatten the curve? How do we make that slope less severe? Before we get there, I wanna remind you that what we're doing here is a many model approach. This is just one model. Let's go back to the wisdom hierarchy. Remember we had data and then we had information, putting that data in categories. Then we had knowledge, understanding, why do we see the patterns that we see? Well, at the top of the wisdom hierarchy is wisdom. And wisdom comes from having a bunch of models, from using multiple lenses to look at a problem. So in a previous video, I talked about expected fatality models. And we saw in that video that as you get older, you're much more likely to suffer fatality. And from that, one of the things we learned that it's incredibly important to make sure that older people don't get the disease. Well, let's think about what the SIR model tells us. It's somewhat complicated, so we want to simplify it. Now, if you notice, there's an I, a number of infected on each side of this inequality. So what we can do is we can just cross those out. This is just basic algebra. The other thing we might notice is this. Early on in the process, the number of susceptible people is very similar to the total population. So we can just replace that with the number one. And then if we kind of clear all this stuff out, we get a much simpler equation. That the number of contacts times the probability of spreading has to be bigger than the probability of recovering. If we move the probability of recovering down to the other side, we get the following inequality. If the number of contacts times the spread divided by the recovery rate is bigger than one, the disease is gonna spread. This term on the left-hand side is known as R0, the basic reproduction number. If the basic reproduction number is bigger than one, the disease spreads. If the basic reproduction number is less than one, the disease does not spread. So R0 equals one is a tipping point. Less than one, no epidemic. Bigger than one, you get an epidemic. Now it's not quite that severe. What you get is if it's less than one, there's no epidemic. When it gets right at one, you start to get an epidemic and it goes up really, really fast. So once you get an R0 close to two, a large proportion of the population is gonna get the disease. R0 is something you can compute. So for HIV, R0 was estimated at two to five. For polio, four to seven. And for the measles, R0 is bigger than 10. So what is R0 for COVID-19? Well, here's what we wanna think about. R0 is partly up to us. Let's go back to the expression for the basic reproduction number. It's the number of contacts times the spread divided by the recovery. What we'd like to do is make this as small as possible. Well, how could we do it? Well, we could speed the recovery rate, right? We could make it so the probability somebody recovers is faster. That's not something individuals can do, but it might be something that doctors can do. Doctors may be able through medication to make it so people recover faster. But what can people do? Well, we can reduce the number of contacts. We can, through social distancing and quarantine, not be in contact with as many people. We can also reduce the probability of transmission. We can wash our hands, we can wear masks. That, together with having fewer contacts, makes the numerator smaller. So what are the implications? The implications of this model are as follows. Epidemics produce an S-shaped curve, and there's gonna be exponential growth early. That means if you see five cases, 15 cases, 50 cases, it could be reason to worry if the number of cases is increasing quickly. Second, R0, the basic reproduction number, determines whether an epidemic occurs. It's a tipping point. Now I have determines in quotes and the reason why is because we are partly in control of what R0 is. R0 is a function of the virus, and it's a function of our action. One big advantage of models is they help us think clearly. They help us to reason. In this particular case, the SAR model tells us, oh my goodness, it all boils down to this basic reproduction number, how many contacts we have, and the likelihood of spreading. But when you think about the SAR model, we realize kind of a mistake because it's assuming everybody has the same number of contacts. 
That's true. It's a simplifying assumption. All models are wrong. And in this particular case, the SIR model sort of assumes random mixing. It assumes that each person has the same number of contacts and they're just drawing those contacts from the population. So when we look at that model, one of the places where we realize we might want to improve upon it is here in the number of contacts. And instead of assuming that everybody has the same number, what we might want to do is assume that people belong to networks. So we'd like to take the SIR model and do the SIR model plus networks. We'll talk about that in a later video. For now, I want to thank you for paying attention and wish you the very, very best. Thanks.